friends, I did a really big seat order a while ago. And I'm going to tell you what I spent at the end of the video. I ordered from a seed company called Fruition Seeds. And I'm going to have to show you the absolute amazing haul I got. It's something the dreams are made out of. I'm pretty sure this seed order is what dreams are made out of. Let's take a look at what I got. And it's a lot and it's amazing. You want to see the whole spiel, the whole order. It's pretty much like an entire garden in a box. Let's check it out. Here is our box. I removed the label so my address isn't showing, but you can see Fruition Seeds is out of New York. <laughs> Reminds me of that salsa commercial. It's like, um, New York City. I can't believe it was made in New York City. I'm just kidding. Naples, New York. Let's go ahead and check this out. And I know that um, New York has a lot of really amazing farmlands too. Um, not everything is in the city. They included this nice seed list invoice that is, okay, that's two pages, three pages long. Wow. What's in here? It's a surprise. They included a sticker. That's cute. That could go on like the seed binder. If I use a seed binder to collect, to organize these, or if I use a little tote or something, I can put this on the outside. They included a sweet little message. Thank you. That's very sweet. And they included this growing guide, which is kind of nice. It's for the Northeast and I'm in the Northwest. But a lot of things that grow in the Northeast, I think it's pretty similar climate wise because of, you know, the whole um, latitude, longitude coordinates. So we are on the West Coast, but um, we have a similar climate, I believe. I think it does get colder in New York, though. Wow. Where do I start? Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> Let me get organized. Why in the world did I buy four or maybe more packages of the seed variety? Well, actually, it's because it says it's a perennial and it's only 45 to 55 days to harvest. So it's a really quick turnaround and it's going to be high yielding for many years. So I think that's amazing. That's why I got several packets. It's an heirloom, which who doesn't love heirlooms? That's something you can really rely on the genetics. Perennial vegetables, huzzah, okay? So full to part sun, perennial, um, as early as three weeks before last frost, you can sow two seeds or soil blocks indoors and thin. Okay, that's cool. So you can start these pretty early. I like that. Nice. So this sounds like something that would be great to grow in a survival garden because it's perennial, it's perennial, it's prolific, and it's a quick turnaround crop. So excellent. Why did I buy three packages or more of thyme? It's because I already have thyme, but mine is really old. It does. It is very perennial. Um, my thyme is really old and getting really woody and weedy looking. So I would like to, I'm going to still keep it going. Obviously I never get rid of plants. <laughs> <laughs> um, some people try to make things look tidy and get rid of their beautiful plants, um, to make it look prettier, but I do not do that. However, I want to make sure I never run out of time. It's one of our favorites. It smells wonderful, even just for aromatherapy, just smelling it when you're walking around in your garden. But th these are perennial. You want to start them from seeds indoors and transplant them. Don't try to direct sow. Um, you do need to tend your herbs, um, perennial herbs a little bit more cautiously so that you can really ensure that you get high germination rates and that those plants actually, um, don't get, you know, just eaten up by something or overwhelmed by other things you're growing. So, um, I start my perennial herbs indoors and I'm going to show you all those tricks later on in the season. So go ahead and subscribe if you want to see how to grow perennial herbs indoors and then transplant them out later. 
but I got three time because of the perennial nature of it and just to refresh my garden. I didn't just get one. I got four Greek oregano and I do have oregano. I'm not sure what variety it is. This is perennial and I have oregano growing like a weed all over the place, but um, I did kind of regrettably yank out a bunch of oregano and I fed it to my chickens um, because it totally overtook one of my garden beds that I wanted for something else. And so I kind of regret that. So I want to plant some more and that way I can really anticipate where it's going to be. And I want to be better about collecting the seeds so it doesn't go too insane. I don't mind if my yard smells like a pizza after we've mowed it, but, um, I do want to know where they are and I like to give some plants as gifts. I also might sell some plants. So we'll see about that. But I'm going to go ahead and definitely plant a lot of oregano. I also got an abundance of this bouquet dill. And I did that because my youngest son absolutely loves dill. And he'll just stand in the garden and just pick leaves of the dill leaves and eat it. It's also very ornamental, very frilly and fern-like. I do want to make uh, quick pickles this year. So if you want to see quick pickles, go ahead and like, subscribe, and all that jazz. Um, but we're going to be making a lot of that. I also like dill leaves in sandwiches, in salads, in soups. And I want to start collecting it and drying it. We usually use everything that we have. So I want to see if I can get enough going that I can actually dry some for the winter months for next year. So, um, yeah, I want to make sure I have a lot of these growing. And also this is not a perennial, it's an annual. So you do have to plant it every year, but if you let a few plants go to seed, actually, if you just let one plant go to seed, you will have so many seeds. I actually have handfuls of dill seeds because my husband was actually working on a property and they said, please get rid of that because it looked weedy and it was the, their dill plant had gone to seed. And so he gave me all these, um, spent flower heads and I collected all the seeds and dried them out and, um, put them in my, my seed storage. So I have lots of dill, but, um, I want a lot and I like to know variety names and things like that. So I don't know the variety names and the other type I have. So a few, a few with variety names is nice, but I'm going to plant everything. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be picky. Found some more time. Where does all the time go? <laughs> time goes by so fast, you know, time is fleeting. Unless you're talking about actual time, then it's perennial. Summer savory. So I grow winter savory. And the reason I know it's winter savory is not because I'm an expert, but because it comes back every year and summer savory is supposed to be an annual. So this must be the summer savory. And I've heard that it's really good in potato salad. So I want to make sure I grow a lot of this because I grow a lot of potatoes and I love making homemade potato salad in the summertime. It's just really wonderful, especially when you make it with red and purple and blue potatoes. It's amazing. So this is going to be awesome. It's an annual, so I will have to save seeds. And savory does seed very well. So collecting seeds from those plants afterwards will mean that you don't have to buy seeds in the future. I got several packets of this yarrow. And it is perennial, native, and medicinal. And I have actually not grown, actually, I might have grown some in a container once and lost track of it. I th it might be in my greenhouse, but I've never grown it and actually used it. Um, so it's going to be a new experience. So you can grow alongside me and we can experience this plant together. And it does say to start them six weeks before the last frost barely covering with soil transplant only. So this is going to be taking up a little space in, in the home before um, the last frost. But I think it's really worth it, especially with it being a medicinal and perennial and native and pollinator friendly. So I want to get a lot of this growing. I want to make sure I never run out. So this is kind of like Noah's Ark. 
you know, I'm going to be saving and rotating seeds. So I never run out of these wonderful varieties. And, um, for the longevity of these species and for our species as well. So I really want to make sure that nothing gets left out. Um, I wonder if anybody else feels the same way of just like your seed stash is kind of like Noah's Ark. Am I alone? Does anyone else feel that way too? I had to step away for a second, but um, I am back and I wanted to show you these mesh bags I got from Timu. And I actually got five of them. They're quite large, as you can see. I got five for five dollars, and I think it was five dollars and forty-eight cents or something like that. It was under five fifty for five. So I thought these were pretty neat, and I've been thinking about seed organization, and I might want to try these more. Um, I like it, so I've started to put some of the ones I've already talked to you about into one of these off the side because it's they're slippery and it's hard to like keep track of them. Um, I already talked to you guys about the yarrow, so I'll put that off to the side and we'll start moving on with the other varieties. So I've got four packages of the blue vervain. It is um, a perennial and the packaging says to start them one to six weeks before the last frost indoors and transplant them out after the last frost. And they're beautiful pollinator um, attractors and look how pretty they are. The flowers kind of remind me of plantain, but obviously pretty purple, not just the plain brown and green. Really lovely. I guess I need to have four of everything because one, uh, two is one and one is none. And four is how many? <laughs> I did get the fever few, which is a medicinal and I'm still looking up, you know, how, how to use it and so forth. Do your own research. It's an annual, so I want to make sure I um, save seed from one year to the next so that we have that ongoing genetics um, in our seed vaults. And so those are going to go along with my medicinals. And it's also supposed to be a really great pollinator-friendly plant. So fever few. This beautiful plant is called Bone Set, and it is a medicinal it's also native, perennial, and pollinator friendly. The instructions say to start them before the last frost. And um, so it says one to five weeks before the last frost. You're going to want to harden these off before you transplant them out, which you want to do that with all of your herbs and perennials and medicinal plants that you're starting indoors. And you should do that with your things like your tomatoes, that kind of stuff too. Always harden them off first. That means give them a couple hours a day in the normal temperature outside um, and bring them back in, and especially at nighttime, and then longer and longer time outside until eventually they're outside. So it's like baby steps. Um, yeah, so bone, bone set sounds really interesting, and um, I'm looking more into though to this variety because I have not grown it before. If you know anything about bone set, go ahead and comment below in the comment area. How are you using bone set and what is your experience growing it? It looks like I got eight packages of this bee balm and it's native medicinal perennial. And I just realized I was reading the packages wrong. Um, whenever I've said one to five weeks or one to six weeks, it um, it's actually... It's telling you to thin your plants to one and then there's a space and it says about five weeks before less frost. I have glasses, but I need bifocals. <laughs> um, so five weeks before last frost, the other ones where I said one to six weeks, it should have just been six weeks, not one. That wouldn't make sense anyway. And these also need to be hardened off, but these are going to be perennials and it says it to zone three in zone three and I'm in zone eight. So these should definitely be perennializing in my zone as well and one thing I really thought was cool about this one is it says that the flowers are medicinal and delicious see gorgeous delicious and medicinal and I love the idea of having more butterflies but also I'm really interested in edible flowers I think that would be really beautiful a beautiful way to use my garden in our daily lives. 
So be bomb, and I've got plenty of it. And I've got sweet marjoram, which is very similar in appearance, scent, and flavor to oregano. It's a little bit more mild and a little bit sweeter. And this is also a perennial. And we're starting those indoors about six weeks before the last frost. And um, I'm a little confused about the seed package here when it says, um, what was confusing here? It says, Mediterranean reminiscent of oregano, beloved in sitar, the herbal blend. So I'm wondering what they mean by that. Like, are these all the same type of seeds or is this an actual blend? I'm confused. So, do you know what I'm saying? It says, heirloom, Mediterranean, and reminiscent of oregano, beloved in Zaatar, the herbal blend. Is the Zaatar, is this an herbal blend? Because I thought it was just sweet marjoram. Anyway, I'm going to plant it. I believe it's just um, marjoram, sweet marjoram, which I've grown before, and will grow again. And I apparently thought I needed four of all of these. So I'm starting to see why I got four packages each. And that's because when I ordered the seed options, it didn't allow one pack. It would say something like 200 seeds. And this is 50 seeds. So if I ordered 200 seeds, I got four packets. And so I'm not quite sure why that happened. Why there wasn't just one packet with 200 seeds. Um... And if they had been offered at one packet, I would have just got one for some of them. But I don't regret it. Um, I knew what I was paying for them. I just wasn't realizing that I was going to get four packets instead of just one. Which is kind of nice because I can like, have one to grow this year, one to grow next year, and then maybe have some for um, gifts. I think that's a good idea. So here I have Spilanthes. I might be saying that incorrectly. Spilanthes. 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 Hmm. It sounds like it's a um, Olympian, a Olympic athlete. It's heirloom, cheerful, and medicinal. Okay, this is the toothache plant, and so it has kind of like that um, numbing effect, right? So the idea is like if you had um, a a painful cavity, you chew it on the area that has a cavity so that um, you get the numbing effect there and I've heard some people making some kind of salve so it has like a topically numbing effect um, I haven't tried it yet so do your own research and when I try things I'm going to definitely um, share my experiences but try things on your own as well but also make sure you do your own research be diligent in doing your own research and make sure you know what plant you have so you're not just like chewing on a marigold. I don't know. Maybe that's okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> but this is too thick plant. And I've been meaning to grow up for a long time. I do have some older seeds that I should use before I use these. Which I have to get that rotation going soon. These giant yellow hyssop just look absolutely gorgeous. They're, they have edible flowers, which is awesome. And it says that they are delicious and sweet. They have the the plant itself has a licorice kind of scent to it. It's perennial, and they suggest that you start seeds indoors about four weeks before your last frost. Harden them off before you put them outdoors. So hyssop is going to be in my garden this year for sure. It's so gorgeous. Valerian is a well-known medicinal plant that's also very ornamental. It's beautiful in landscapes. I think it kind of reminds me of like baby's breath or Queen Anne's lace. I don't know. Those tiny little clusters of flowers are really pretty. Make sure that you identify them correctly as you could have weed seeds kind of floundering around your garden. You want to make sure that you're using it properly, identifying it properly as well. And so I found two seed packets. There's probably two more in here, I'm guessing. And um, so you're going to start these indoors before your last frost, about five, um, eight weeks. So this one takes a little bit longer. So about eight weeks before your last frost, harden them off and transplant them out after your last frost. And then you have perennial valerian. It's gorgeous. 
Do your own research on medicinals. The descriptions for this winter Sibley squash are so attractive that I bought what I thought were two large packets, but it's eight packets um, of the Sibley winter squash. And let, I have to show you guys the back of the package because it sounds kind of incredible. It says that um, magnificent flavor, texture sublime, reliably abundant, and stores through the following June. So, we need, with seed security, you need to be growing some winter squashes that are really good keepers, which means they are shelf stable for a really long time. In June, there, it's pretty thin pickings in your garden. You know, you're just getting some, you know, radishes and some snap peas and really small things. So having something from the previous year that's still good, that's what they call the hungry gap, like the beginning. Um, so like, like February, March, April, May, like when, in the beginning, like in between when you're running out of your fall stores before your spring harvests are starting to come in, it's called the hungry gap and having shelf stable squash like this winter Sibley, um, that lasts like, so if you're harvesting it in the fall, it's lasting months and months and months. So, and of course you have to cure it. I'm sure you have to cure it to make sure that the rind is intact and, um, uh, proper. So I'm going to have to do some more research because I haven't grown Sibley squash yet. And I've never had a squash that lasted that long. So I'm really looking for winter squashes because in my, in my gardens, I've grown, grown, uh, all kinds of different pumpkins and stuff, but we would use them like in October, November. And, um, I never really tried saving them until spring and summer. So having some that are known to be long shelf life squash or good keepers, um, I think is really important. So I got eight packages, um, and that's, well, that's 20 seeds. So maybe I said, let's see, maybe I said I wanted 150 seeds or something. And then to get 150, I actually got 160. So it's 20 seeds per packet. Um, I want to just have tons of these. I want to be able to just give them as gifts and to plant them everywhere. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking about doing some little sleuth gardening. You have to be careful because you can get in trouble for that. But like just have a pocket full of seeds and then like walk around some trails, dig a little hole with my foot, put a seed in, cover it up with my, with my shoe and walk away. Um, I've heard of people actually trying to like pirate, do like little pirate garden areas in different, different places and they've gotten like arrested. So don't do that. Like, but I'm just thinking like having a pocket full of non-invasive plants that have food quality, really important stuff. Um, we might be coming up on hard times and having food that you can just glean from the neighborhood or from trails that you walk constantly, um, might be a good thing. So winter squash, make sure it's in your garden. Another thing to note is that with squash, it's just so easy to direct sow. Um, direct sowing is a great way to prevent root, root disturbance. Um, I also got these winter squash delicata and it doesn't tell me if they're good keepers, but it does say that they have really thin skin. So I'm going to assume that they're not, um, as good as the Sibley, but it does say harvest before frost and cure. So if you don't cure it, you can eat it right out of the garden. But if you cure it in a warm place with good airflow, then it will store longer. So I need to learn how to do that. Um, it's not something that we've really practiced because we kind of like just 
pick our stuff and then eat it or pick it and use it, right? Um, but I want to learn how to pick it and cure it and keep it um, to have have a little bit more longevity in the harvest. Um, so direct sowing is re um, recommended and this is supposed to be uh, very easy to prepare delicious foods and it's supposed to have a really fabulous flavor. So I got delicata and I'm pretty sure I have other delicatas. So I'm going to use those before I use these. These are going to be like um, my Noah's Ark, my seed vault seeds that I save for later. So this squash here is really new to me. It's one of the reasons why I came across the company and was looking for these seeds because of these seeds here. And my understanding is that these are a completely holeless, I think it's, is that an acorn squash? Um, but it's, it says delectably holeless seed. So like I have some naked seeded pumpkins, these are like naked seed. And so the seeds are really delicious, um, as well as the squash itself. And these are pretty interesting. It's a curcubita pepo. So if you're growing different varieties of squash, if you want to grow like three different types, make sure it's a different species. If they're the same genus and species, they will cross. So the second word here needs to be a different word. If you don't want them to cross and you want to save seeds from them, I don't want to ruin the seed, the holistness of these seeds because that's so, such a draw to be able to scoop out seeds that don't have a shell and you can just add some salt, toast them up and you have a delicious snack. You can put those on salads. You could eat them just like that. Um, that's great. And then you can also use the squash itself. So, um, I'm loving that. I think it's great. I'm also going to be growing some holeless pumpkins. And I'm going to put this into my little mesh baggie with all my squash. So as I've been filming, I've been using different baggies for different stuff. So I have one that's just for the flowers and medicinals. One that's just for squash. That's helping me stay organized. I came across these Anise Hyssop. And we already saw the giant yellow hyssop. So these are similar, um, presenting a little bit different with the flowers and the size. And this is also a perennial, edible, medicinal perennial. I mean, doesn't that just sound beautiful? Edible, medicinal, perennial. It's almost like a chant. Edible, medicinal, perennial. Edible, medicinal, perennial. <laughs> All right. It just sounds like, I don't know, like something really beautiful. Anyway. Okay. So I'm going to put those in the baggie with the rest of the herbs. Scarlet Emperor Pole Snap Beans are absolutely beautiful. They are not lying when they call it ornamental. Absolutely beautiful. Stunning. They need something to climb or some kind of trellis. And you do want to direct sow these. Don't start them indoors. It'll just be a tangled mess. And they don't really like to be disturbed. Um, the flowers attract hummingbirds, bees, and all of that good stuff. On the packaging, it does say that you can eat them when they are as snap beans. So you can eat them as snap beans and then you can also have the dry purple beans. Oh, they're so pretty in a glass jar dried, um, in a glass jar, they store so beautifully. It's so charming to have those up in a pantry on a shelf somewhere, um, visible, you know, it's so pretty obviously not great for it. It's better not to have them in light, but they're just so beautiful. It's like artwork, honestly. So the beans, these actually remind me a lot of Scar Scarlet Runner beans, um, but these are the Scarlet Emperor pole. So a little bit different, but very similar to um, those Scarlet Runners that you normally see. These are Scarlet Emperor and I'm excited about those. The beans themselves are like jewels. Just absolutely gorgeous. These, um, they grow really fast. So some people like to grow their, their runner beans or their pole beans with corn for three sisters. But I find 
that the corn just does not grow fast enough, enough for me, at least in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the pole beans grow so fast that it's a big, crazy, tangled mess. And sometimes the corn doesn't grow that tall either, even if it does grow fast. So I like to grow these with sunchokes. So if you want to grow sunchokes, which is also called Jerusalem artichokes from tubers, those are inedible as well. You eat the tubers. They grow these tall stalks like the sunflowers, but they have really tiny, not really um, showy flowers. And the snap beans make up for it because they have flowers, profuse flowers all over the place. So I like to grow them with sunchokes. Or, of course, you can grow them on a trellis. So I might have bought these just for the name Chocolate Runner. <laughs> okay. You put chocolate in a name for a plant, and I'm definitely going to get my get myself some. So Chocolate Runner Pole Beans, and these are dry beans. They look very similar. The speckled purple seeds to the other runners, the Scarlet Runners. Um, and these are going to be for dry beans. And they're apparently very attractive to hummingbirds. You are also going to want to direct sow these and have a trellis or a living trellis like the sunchokes for these seeds. Lovely. And I just want to make sure I never run out of them because they're so absolutely ornamental, beautiful. It's like living artwork in your garden that you can also eat. And also the wildlife enjoys the nectar from the flowers. Ooh, look at that. Zyre's Breadseed Poppies, Abundant Edible Heirloom. That's gorgeous. I can never decide. So it does say that you can direct sow about six weeks before the final frost. Or they recommend that you transplant them. So sow them inside eight weeks or two months before your last frost. And then you're going to harden them off before you transplant them. It doesn't say you have to cold stratify them. And that's what I'm kind of wondering about poppies is if you find when, if you've grown poppies, do you find that they germinate better if they've been cold stratified or not? Does it really make a difference? I planted some different flowers that they said you had to cold stratify and I didn't and they grew just fine. So I'm, I don't want to take the extra step of cold stratifying if I don't absolutely have to. And with direct seeding, we get so much rain and I'm afraid that the seeds would just wash out of some of the containers that I have because this time of year is just so wet. Even six weeks before my last frost, it's still like the wet season. So I would prefer to plant them indoors and transplant them out and, and not do the whole cold stratification. So have you grown poppies from seed? If you have... Do you cold stratify or do you think it makes a difference? And I've got these here. These are the bread seed poppies, which you can save the seeds for growing, or you can actually use them for like poppy seed muffins, things like that. And um, I'm also curious if anybody else is growing poppies, if how much they cross pollinate, because I have a lot of different varieties. So what are your comments? Go ahead and comment below if you have a lot of experience with poppies. I actually have like a jar of poppy seeds because my husband was able to procure me some dried um, poppy seed heads from um, a person he was working for who wanted them cleared out of their garden and he knows me so I was able to shake 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 rattle and roll and get a bunch of seeds and I also saved the seed heads for dry flower arrangements because they're really, really pretty. I'm not going to bust them open. They're just too pretty to do that too. So I get the dry flower pod with stem and I also saved my seed. So that was a lot of fun. And it's going to be interesting to see what I get out of my seeds because I didn't see the flowers when they were blooming. So they could be any color, any variety. I don't know. But I also have these packages of seeds. Um, and I always grow um, the California poppies, which are not really what we're talking about here these are mostly probably from chi the chinese poppies 
um, versus the California poppies, the native ones, which are native to California, and they're the California state flower. Those orange, beautiful poppies actually is one of the reasons that inspired me to grow flowers in the first place. I grow a lot of calendula in my garden, and I save my own seeds, but I'm sure it's a common variety, um, not even a named variety, and so I, you know, I just have it growing everywhere, and I love them. So I saw a few different um, varieties from Fruition Seeds that I liked. These are called zeolites, and um, they're supposedly, like, they're specifically talking about edible petals, which may be true for all calendula. Please fact check, but that's my understanding. I could be wrong, so double check that. Um, but it says edible petals, and so you just just the petals. But it says here that it's apricot colored on one side of the petals and that the back side is a different color. So it says it has a burgundy back. So that sounds really interesting to be one, like I've never seen these before. But supposedly on one side you have the apricot color and on the back of it, it is burgundy. So you can garnish salads, soups, and cakes with that. That would be really pretty. I'm not sure what calendula tastes like. I just have been growing it. It's just beautiful. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of butterflies flocking to my calendula, but I do see... Um, I do see them, I do see a lot of hummingbird, uh, uh, no, 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 hold on, bumblebees, lots of bumblebees, all different kinds of um, pollinators, like just the honeybees, as well as hoverflies, I've seen those too. Um, maybe this particular variety will attract more butterflies, I love them in my garden for sure. So calendula, and I also got another kind that's really special. Hold on. So I got this Resina calendula. Now all calendula are supposed to be medicinal, but Resina is the kind that has the most resins that are supposed to be the most therapeutic um, properties. So I got four of these packages because I really want to have a lot of this because I have a lot of friends and family who suffer from eczema, psoriasis, rashes, dry skin, all kinds of stuff. And I plan on making medicinal salves using the Resina calendula specifically. So I'm going to have like a whole field or a whole raised bed just of these because I want to make sure I can go in, pick all the flowers I need, and then make the salves. And I, some of the key ingredients are going to be the calendula, um, beeswax, possibly going to do some olive oil, I'm thinking, um, as well as, give me a second, I'm thinking plantain. So I'm thinking plantain leaves in there as well because they are also very good for skin. So I might do some with just the calendula and some with with the plantain leaves. I might even do one to include jewelweed um, because jewelweed is supposed to help with like, um, I want to say poison ivy. Poison ivy, is it poison ivy or poison oak? Um, they often grow close to each other too. So I'm going to grow jewelweed as well, but I'm definitely going to be making salves with calendula this summer. So if you want to see that, click like, subscribe, and if you have made your own salves, comment below what was your recipe because I want to try a few out and see what I like the best. These flowers are just so pretty and interesting. They're called Chim Chimney. Chim Chimney, Chim Chimney, Chim Chim Tree. Uh, sweep is as happy as happy it can be. Or I'm not, is it lucky? Um, Chim Chimney Rebecca. Okay. And um, Rebecca, one of my favorite Rebeccas is Black Eyed Susan. And um, how I remember the name of Rebecca is it's like the person's being rude and her name's Becky. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Rebecca is Chim Chimney. And it's really good in bouquets. It's perennial. The instructions say to start them indoors, you know, about a month and a half before um, your last frost. Transplant them out. 
and when they after they're they flowered you want to deadhead them so that you'll get more flowers so that's awesome and i love that they're perennial i always sometimes i sometimes feel that growing annuals is a waste of time so perennials feels like a more of an investment and these are so lovely what in the heyday is this <laughs> how many of you guys play heyday be honest you know i do anyway so whenever i played heyday and you're planting what looks like lavender it's actually indigo um indigo is used to dye fabrics and so i thought it would be a fun arts and crafts project not really going to be survival right here but just arts and crafts using it to dye and then um materials apparently silk is the best to use with indigo um which obviously it's like, oh, how many of us just have a bunch of silk laying around, like true silk. Um, but I thought maybe I'd try it on some other fabrics too, even if it doesn't work as well. Um, I don't have a silk farm. So yeah, it'd be, be pretty pricey. But um, this indigo round leaf, it's for dyeing fabrics. And I think it's an annual. It is an annual. And you're going to want to start it four weeks before the final frost indoors and transplant it out after their last frost always harden them off before I'm assuming you know what hardening off means sounds kind of fishy but what it means is that you don't shock your plants by just taking them from inside and putting them outside you give them like little baby steps a couple hours a day you know longer several hours a day and and never put one of the big things when you're hardening off your plants is don't put them in direct light like really bright sunny spots that's the worst, even more than the cold, is going from indoors, not having so much direct light, to being outdoors and a blazing sun. So that really does kill a lot of seedlings. Um, you also don't want it in the windiest spot. So like up against a building um, is nice um, or some kind of structure. So it has a little bit of shade, it has a little bit of wind protection. And then after, you know, a bit of time of that you put them out now I also like to when I'm growing seeds inside um, have a fan a small little little fan that's kind of going back and forth blowing on the seeds and that's so that the stems are nice and strong and your plants won't be so so weird weak and leggy um, so definitely want to make sure you have airflow and if you don't have that at least brush the tops of your your plants with your fingers gently um, kind of like you're petting them. <laughs> so pet your plants so that they get nice, strong stems. Yes, I got more yarrow. This variety is called summer berries and it's really pretty. Look at it. It's like white pastel, uh, pastel purples and pinks and beige and like, uh, ivory or, you know, kind of like these like natural tones, just really beautiful. When I was younger, I probably would have said that those were old lady colors. I'm not kidding. I was kind of mean in my mind. Um, I'd see that something like a hydrangea or an azalea. I literally used to think that like azaleas and hydrangeas were old lady flowers. And those hues, those soft blues, purples, and pinks, that are kind of like what you'd imagine, um, I don't know, an old lady's eyeshadow palettes. Um... I remember being a kid, you know, and you have, you know, older pe ladies would have like blue eyeshadow. <laughs> um, but now there's something about life. I don't know that it gives you different perspective. Things that I used to think weren't, um, maybe even thinking some certain things were a little bit homely or not quite as eye catching. I now appreciate them. I appreciate the, the detail, the simplicity, um, and they're all beautiful. And I think that's part of the wisdom of, of life as you're aging is to see the beauty in things that maybe you didn't appreciate when you were younger. It's like, you know, I, I guess it makes up for your back and knees hurting is appreciating things that you, that you didn't notice when you were younger. And here we have a perennial milkweed. I want to encourage butterflies. And yes, there are monarchs that get this far north. 
Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so I want to support their just their gestational their their life cycle for the little caterpillars because their caterpillars, their young, only eat the foliage of milkweed. So I want to have a lot of this in my yard. It's perennial and you're going to want to start it four weeks before the last frost indoors and transplant it out. And make sure you know what it looks like because I'm pretty sure I accidentally weeded it out before because it does look like a weed. Um, the flowers are pretty, but the really common types of milkweed you might just not realize and accidentally get rid of it. So make sure that you know what you are pulling when you're pulling your weeds because milkweed is what baby monarchs eat. I'm not going to talk long about this. Sugar snap peas, you know you need them. They're delicious. They don't ever get inside the house. That's why I get so much more. Um, just, I just want to make sure that we have enough to actually bring inside for our salads and stuff. Because all we do is snack on them in the garden. It's like a snack. It's just a little garden snack outside. Make sure you got your snap peas. And I got a few packages of some greens. I've got some endive, claytonia, our miner's lettuce, which is very good for you. I believe it's pretty high in vitamin C. It's how the miners uh, were able to stave off getting scurvy. So Claytonia is really, really good. And then I also got some Asian greens. And figure out where I put those because almost everything else I got was different. These are beautiful. and They should be good in uh, bouquets or peony, um, scarlet peony poppies. Scarlet peony poppies. They look like peonies, but they're poppies. And cornfield poppies. Which reminds me of those, like, I think there's a Danish, there's a Danish variety that, um, that one reminds me of. Anyway, so I've got those. Those are going to be really good for floral arrangements. I'm sure you've heard of echinacea. And it says that the flower petals are edible, um, medicinal, ornamental. Do your own research. So you're starting these about five weeks before the last frost indoors and then transplanting them out. They are perennials. Beautiful too. Very beautiful. I've got some seeds for Green Twister, which I think I got from Strictly Medicinal. They, um, I only was able to get maybe one or two packets ever. They're always sold out. So I got Green, green Twister, Echinacea somewhere, and then I've also got these. So pretty. So these are going to go in with my greens. It's amaranth, but it's a veggie type of amaranth. So Amaranth, it, they call it an ancient grain because the seeds are used. There's all kinds of cool stories about amaranth. It was actually illegal for a long time because the Aztecs would combine some of the plant parts with human blood during a sacrifice or something. So the Spaniards thought that was super evil and they banned it and it was illegal for a long time. But now that this, the taboo has been lifted and there's no more human sacrifice, um, amaranth is really coming out of the woodworks and it becoming very, very popular as they, they call it an ancient grain. The seeds themselves are not a grain. They are actually seeds, not grain. Um, that's botanical terminology anyway. So the amaranth, this is Jamaican callaloo. A lot of amaranth, like love flies bleeding. Um, there's all different kinds. I've got like golden giant. I'll, uh, oh, there's just so many varieties. This specifically is a Jamaican callaloo and that callaloo is actually a dish that is, um, I have not made it yet, but it's supposed to be like just wonderful side dish. So, um, this is going to be something we try this year. I also have seed somewhere that's tricolor callaloo. Um, I've grown the tricolor before and it was not very prolific and it did not get very big. So I'm hoping these will be more a substantial crop and these are going to go in with my edible greens. This stunning flower is called Hungarian blue bread seed poppy as if it wasn't enough that they're beautiful. They also have the bread seed. These are bread seed poppies. So just as the name implies, they're the kind that you have the little poppy seeds on your muffins and stuff. 
that's where you get them. And I have another variety that I already showed you, but these are bread seed poppies. And I want to make sure I keep them separate because I want them to stay true to type. And I am not sure how much they cross. So I'm going to be careful so I can keep the integrity and genetic um, purity of the seeds. Dahlias are so lovely. And these are compact dahlia tubers. And it's called Hope is a Verb. And these are supposed to be started four weeks before the last frost. And I agree with their description. This fl these flowers are breathtaking. And these are going to be pretty small, only about one to three feet tall. So I want to have my planting so I have like taller flowers in the back against the fence and then a little bit shorter and then a little bit shorter and then a little bit shorter. So it's just going to be masses and masses of flowers. So um, I really want to make it less sparse with the flowers and kind of also stagger the plantings and the bloom time so that something is always blooming. So this is going to be really pretty. This Gouda winter squash is supposed to be a smaller version of the Long Island cheese pumpkin, which um, sounds wonderful. I have the Long Island cheese pumpkin seeds and we'll be growing those somewhere. And these are supposed to also be very wonderful, just as wonderful, just smaller, more compact, um, sweeter, creamier. And it says that if you cure it well, it should last all winter long. So that's nice. And it's a smaller portion. So when you cut into it, you don't have to worry about the other half spoiling because you're going to prepare the whole thing. So that's kind of neat. So it's one, one way of thinking about it. If you have a large family, then grow the Long Island cheese. And if it's just one or two people, maybe grow the Gouda or grow them both and see which one you like better. Winter squash Gouda. And again, these will cross pollinate unless you have a different species. So this one is Curcubita machada. So if I grew it next to a Pepo or a Maxima, that would be okay, but not next to another one in the same species or the, of the machada. Okay. So this is actually a rare seed. It's called the Sequoia bush snap bean. They are purple flat and in the Romano style. And, um, they sound lovely. So they look really beautiful. That really dark color will make it easy to make sure that you don't miss any. A lot of times when I'm growing beans, when it's a green pod, you might miss some of them, which is not the end of the world because then you can save the seeds if they dry. Um, but it does slow down the production. So um, this says harvest young for maximum sweetness and production. The more you pick them, the more they grow. And then what I would do is let the last couple beans just go ahead and let those, you know, let those mature up and dry and then save the beans for next time. Make sure that you are um, growing these, um, especially with them being rare. I would want to grow them not next to any other kind of beans, although beans are not supposed to cross pollinate in too crazy fashion. But I would want to keep the integrity of these beans since they are said to be rare. So these look really yummy. Everyone needs to get some cucumbers from Croatia. These are called dragon's egg and they're supposed to be small. And um, the more you pick them, the smaller you pick them, the smaller the seeds, the sweeter and tastier they're going to be. So pick them immature. If you want to save for seeds, you let them become mature, but it's going to slow down production. So these are really cool. They're heirlooms and they're from Croatia. They're called cucumber dragon's egg. Pink plume celery. Everyone needs some pink celery, you know? Um, so you're going to start these indoors a month and a half to two months before your last frost, harden them off and then transplant them outside. Once you get celery going, it might be kind of tricky at first because most people try to direct sow. So you're going to try to actually plant them indoors and then transplant them. And then you'll know where they are and they will take over and become a weed. You'll find celery everywhere after they go to seed. Um, if you let a few of them go to seed, you will have seeds for life. So pink plume celery, it's absolutely beautiful, aesthetic, ornamental, and edible. Make sure you have some different kinds of celery. I also really like the um, white Chinese celery from Baker Creek. 
So for northern gardeners who don't grow collards, I want to really recommend that you do. I actually find that collards grow better and taste better than kale. Now I have all sorts of kales, all sorts of collards, and I grow them both. But collards are very underrated and they're, they're really good. They grow very well here too, so I'm not quite sure why they're not more popular. Henpeck collards are supposed to be sweeter and more tender. So I'm giving those a try and they look really beautiful. Look at those leaves. Um, some, some kales can be like really thick and more like you'd probably want to cook it to get it to um, soften up. But these look really yummy. Like maybe I could just make it into a salad. It looks nice. I mean, doesn't that look nice? It almost looks like lettuce. Anyway, they look delicious to me. Do you think hemp pet collards should have a place in your garden? Would you try growing them? I did go ahead and get some more eggplants and I have tons of eggplant seeds. Baker Creek had so many different types and I, I think I bought them all. Honestly, I don't know. Um, Black Beauty is the most common, probably pink tongue long. I also got this Listata di Gandia. And then I got four packages of the Rosa di Napoli. And I have seen a lot of people talking about how amazing these are, the Rosa di Napoli, that they actually, for people who don't even like eggplant, they like this. So, and they're really, we're going to see these inside first. And it's also going to be a month before the last frost. So we want to have all of the things that we like to have growing in our own backyards. And how many packages do I think I need? I didn't say did this many packages, you guys. I basically clicked on a button that said how many seeds I wanted. And it came in multiple packages to add up to that number of seeds. I don't want to butcher the name of these. It's the popping sorghum. So this is cool. You're going to actually direct sow these after your last frost. And it's called Alu Jola. Like, I'm not sure if, what language that is in. So I'm like, I hope I'm not butchering it too bad. But it's supposed to be really good. And so I thought this would be really fun. You can actually pop amaranth seeds too. Obviously, those would be really tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, but I'm not sure. I think this would be fun, a fun project and just an experience. So popping sorghum, I'm going to do this and I'm going to put this in with the sesame as well as what's next. They describe this Chilean green savory corn as just absolutely delicious. So I definitely got some. I'm really planning on growing my country gentleman's corn though. Um, so that's my main priority is to grow the country gentleman, which they don't have those really neat kernels. They're like all kind of like mismatchy. They don't have like rows of kernels. Um, but I've always wanted to grow the country gentleman. And I have enough seeds and I don't want them to go to waste. So I might have to save the Chilean green for another year. But they sound so yummy. They describe it as having like this. I'll have to tell you. Okay. It's, they describe it so much better than I am going to. So they say that it you can roast it or grill it at the milk stage. And it says stock of the cob is heaven. It's flavorful. And it says it's the most um, exquisitely savory corn they've ever tasted. So that sounds divine. And I feel like I need to make it mine. Do you ever just buy seeds because you like the name? This is called Honey Badger. It has bicolored corn kernels. And it's sweet corn. And it looks very scrumptious. Like honey. So I got it. Don't judge me. This looks like an ornamental Indian corn, but this is sweet corn. It's called double red. And it's, it truly is. It, I was about to say it was a feast for your eyes and taste buds, but it says on the packaging. So Fruition Seeds gets to uh, claim their clever marketing um, descriptions. It looks beautiful and it sounds delicious too. So delicious and beautiful. What more can you really ask for? And um, it has more antioxidants because of that deep burgundy color, crimson and red and burgundy. Sounds really yummy. Of course, you want to direct seed corn. Whenever I see people buying 
corn from like Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, and they had like little six packs of corn. It's like you're how much do you pay for corn on the cob? Like corn in the grocery store? Do you pay a dollar an ear? Because if you spent six dollars for that six pack of corn, the most you're gonna get is six cobs of corn. Um, I'm always looking for types of corn that are gonna produce more than one ear. Um, but a lot of varieties don't tell you how many ears they produce per stock. Most of them that don't say that are going to give you one. Most types that have two or three cobs, um, per stock are going to tell you that because it's a big deal. Here's another gorgeous sweet corn called festivity, and they're calling it a rainbow of sweet corn. Um, it reminds me of glass gem or an Indian ornamental corn. And I'm wondering if it's this beautiful in the milk stage where you actually eat it in the milk stage, or if it only colors up like this when it's going, um, to become mature, like you're going to save the seeds from this, right? When you save the seeds, you're saving it from a mature corn cob. You're basically picking the sweet corn in the milk stage, which, which is when it's unripe, it is still immature and it's sweet and just delicious, right? Um, if you're trying to eat a uh, sweet corn when it's really not supposed to be a sweet corn in the milk stage, it tastes kind of starchy and it, it, it bleh, has like a little aftertaste. But if it's a real sweet corn and you're getting it in the milk stage, it should taste sweet and juicy without even cooking it. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And in with saving seeds, maybe letting a few completely go to seed so I can save the seeds. I like saving the seeds in a jar, especially when they're that beautiful. Look at that. It's gorgeous. So in here I have like all my sesame seeds. I have corn and my sorghum and I'm going to zip this this guy up so I don't get them disorganized again. I'm not done unboxing, but I'm going to zip up the ones I know I am done with. So this is all my the, the herbs and medicinals and flowers and things that are going to go with flower arrangements. So I've got all those Rubecchias. I've got the, um, the poppies and all those yarrows and, uh, milkweed and all those other things are all in here as, as well as the millet. I'm going to zip this up. Pretty sure I got all the squash. So I've got the Sibley squash and the Gouda squash and the delicata and the Sibley, and I'm going to zip this up too. These are, I'm really liking these. I can't zip it with that one, just one hand, and I don't have my stand in here, so I can't show you, but they're zipping up really nice. I think I'm going to buy some more of these, especially with them only being about $1.10, $1.20 each. Um, I love it because I can see inside of them, there's little holes so the seeds can kind of breathe. It's not going to hold in moisture. Um, I'm loving this. And then it helps me organize. And it's not like I'm taking one seed packet out, putting it back, putting, taking it out, putting it back and having to organize them so meticulously. Um, and that's not kind of like the, my gardening style anyway, but I do want to keep an inventory so I know what I have for sure. Oh, and I've got some chives. And I don't know why I bought these because I actually did a land race project where I grew chives and I collected the seeds from the largest flowers and then I grew those and over and over again. So I have land race chives with very big flowers um, that are somewhere hiding from me, but I plan on growing those. I don't know why I bought these. I don't know. Can you answer me? Why did I buy these? So if you like onions and you want to have a more sophisticated palette, try a shallot. <laughs> I'm a poet and I know it. Okay. So shallots are really yummy and they do have that kind of, um, oniony flavor, but a little bit more sophisticated, I would say. And you're going to want to start these in March and then transplant them out later. But starting in them in March, we have just a little bit of time to prepare. Make sure you have your space ready. Make sure you have your containers ready um, and you have your seeds. Of course, you need your seeds. So on the scallions, they say six weeks before your last frost. And then for the leeks, it says um, March. So you're going to want to start these indoors and transplant them out later. I got the Japanese 
Not sure how to say that. Not sure I want to try to. Um, and then I've got the Parade Scallions. And I also got the Tadorna Leeks. So if you've already grown onions, it's time to try some scallions and leeks and shallots. I miss one. Sativa Sugarloaf Green Reddish Yo. That looks yum, yum, yum. That looks like a great salad right there. Why did I buy more tomato seeds? I don't know why. I don't have space for all these tomato seeds. Okay, so um, I'm going to grow these Dancing with Smurfs because you know I need to dance with some Smurfs. Obviously. That is a beautiful tomato. Okay, and then I got Paul Robison, right? I got this. I have no uh, idea what it's called, but look at those clusters of tomatoes. That's crazy. Um, Pianolo del Vesuvio or Pianoyo del Vesuvio, Pianolo, Piano, Low, del Vesuvio. I don't know. It reminds me of a guy whose last name I used to know. Uh, yellow submarine cherry tomato gardener sweetheart isn't that cute and then i have a couple of these 10 fingers of naples paste tomatoes and it says it's okay this is why i got them we love san marzano and we love um romas so i'm thinking this is going to be really good for us because we like that variety so much so 10 fingers of naples heirloom cousin of san marzano 75 days to fruits that's awesome i also got some peppers so we've got sweet pepper collage um fondly known as between the lines isn't that pretty and then i got some jalapeno hot peppers crimson carolyn crimson carolyn am i saying that right sweet bell peppers like i need more of those but i need them all i need them all Okay, I have to have them. I'm going to zip up this one. Can I zip it up? One-handed. <gasps> wow, I've got skills. I can zip it up one-handed with my thumb. Good job. That wasn't too dumb. Stop it. I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? I don't know if that's the how it goes. Anyone watch Princess Bride? This is the real reason why I came to this company. And it was because, now I'm remembering, there were a couple of reasons why I came. I did come for that acorn squash that has no uh, shells, the holus acorn squash. But this is the big reason. I wanted this, the Northern Hardy Valencia peanuts. So I've tried growing, um, what do they call it? I want to say it was like tiger tiger eye peanut or tiger something anyway or no jungle peanut i grew jungle peanuts that's what it was i grew jungle peanuts and i actually got the raw peanuts off nuts.com one of my hacks is to buy raw seeds buy right our raw nuts and um they sell them for you to eat them but then i buy them and i grow them so i bought a bunch of and it was a long time ago it was one of it's got to be a decade ago. I grew, I grew jungle peanuts and the plants grew pretty well. I started too late and I didn't have enough space because peanuts actually grow in a kind of unique way. Um, what they do is they have this really minuscule yellow flower and once it's pollinated, it, it is like a peg and the peg sticks down into the soil. You never saw anything like it. So you have a flower and it's pollinated, then it turns downward and it sticks itself into the soil. So your soil has got to be loose and you can't have a bunch of mulch and you can't have it in a skinny little pot and have the peg go into the, like, the air. Like it's like trying to put down into the soil, but it's putting down into just like air. So you have to have a nice space to have your peanuts. Um, and you want to make sure you have long enough and that you have a variety for your climate. So peanuts are kind of hard for the north. We have really wet soils, so I could see them rotting if it gets cold and too damp. So these are the Valencia peanuts. They're the larger size seeds, and these actually have the whole peanut in here. It's like the whole peanut. That keeps the seeds better. 
um, it keeps them safer. It's like their own packaging, their own little safety packaging. It's like packing peanuts, literally, literal packing peanuts. Okay. But you're going to, um, actually plant those. And, um, I'm excited because I think this is going to be like the experiment I did before it, you know, it, it worked, the they germinated, the plants grew, that was cool. And then they all died because they didn't have long enough. So this is going to be a little bit more serious of a project because I spent a good sum of money on these, but I'm hoping that I'll get a good enough harvest that I can save seeds for the next year and not have to buy seeds again um, unless we get hungry and eat them all or the squirrels get to them. But this is exciting. So we have an easy to grow peanut, well adapted to short northeast seasons. I'm in the Northwest. I think my seasons are longer. So I think I'm actually going to have a better, a better deal here. Flowers above ground send stalks to form peanuts below. Those are actually called pegs. Um, an incredible plant to witness and to eat, obviously. So I'm going to be growing these and I did get a lot of packages because I want to grow a lot of them and they're going to be so, so, so yummy. Do you grow peanuts where you live and how do they do for you? Um, if you don't, do you grow anything similar? Like what kind of tuberous or what kind of root crops do you grow? So like, do you grow carrots, rutabagas, turnips, sunchokes, onions, garlic, peanuts, radishes? What do you grow that grows underground? I think it's kind of like the, un, like, not unfashionable, but less um, common maybe. Because a lot of people are growing green leafy things and tomatoes and flowers. Um I see a lot of people growing root crops. So I'm interested. And I grow a lot of potatoes, which is definitely worth their space. And I hope that these are going to be worth their space too. Are you growing root crops? If you are, please comment below. All of the um, peanuts, beans, and peas into one of these bags. And I've got my peppers and tomatoes and um, other kinds of things in here. I've got the greens and eggplants and stuff like that. And here I have all of the squash. I have all the flowers, edibles. Um, yeah, flowers, edibles, flower arrangement stuff in there. And then in this one here, I have all the grains. That's the corn, sorghum, sesame. If you call sesame green, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I put millet in here too. But my millet that I just bought is more ornamental. So, yeah, I've got a good haul here. Several different kinds of corn. I've got an entire farm in these five bags. The bags I got from Timu for $5.48. And I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for the seeds. I want you to comment below. What do you think I paid for the seeds? I'm going to let you guess. If you guess, if you guess right... I don't know. I'm like, I'm going to call your name out on a video and say how smart you are. Okay. That's your reward. If you guess correctly, if you're even within $50 of what I ordered, I'm going to name you. I'll say my next, one of my next videos, what your name is and how smart you are for guessing, for uh, guesstimating, estimating and guesstimating how much I spent here. I'm not ca counting the backs just the seeds. Okay. Did I not tell you it was an amazing seed haul? What varieties of seeds are you just blown away by? And have you ever ordered from Fruition Seeds before? Is this a company that's new to you? Is it something that you're interested in order and interested in ordering from them? And um, yeah, so I'm really interested. Do you, <laughs> you don't have to go as crazy as I do. Okay. And I am scaling back this is my last huge seed order for a long time. I've decided to really put the, um, I don't want to say like restraints, um, to really tether myself 
to no more than 15 to 20 dollars a week and to make that work for me okay so if i want to order from someplace and you have to buy over 20 dollars of stuff to get free shipping that means that's my two week order or that's my month order so um I will be showing some of the seeds that I've been saving from my own garden, which some people have been asking about as well. But I really hope you enjoyed the seed haul. Fruition Seeds seems to have a lot of selection. If you haven't checked them out before, make sure that you give them a chance. Take a look at their website. I'll link it below. All right, everybody. God bless. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe and all that jazz. God bless you. And I'll see you next time.